This is the third video in this series on fungal diseases, and the topic is mycotoxins, allergies, and quackery. Today's learning objectives are to describe the health effects following ingestion of the three major types of mycotoxins, to list allergic disorders associated with mold exposure, and last, to list some diseases which medical science has not linked to fungal exposure. First up is mycotoxin ingestion, where the word mycotoxin refers to any toxic chemical produced by a fungus. There are three flavors of mycotoxin poisoning, that from mushrooms, from something called aflatoxins, and from ergot alkaloids. Despite thousands upon thousands of different mushroom species throughout the world, it's estimated that only 50 to 100 of them are literally poisonous. Unfortunately, to the inexperienced, Toxic mushrooms can look nearly identical to non-toxic ones. Consider these mushrooms, commonly known as chanterelles. These are commonly used in various cuisines of Europe. But they look just a little bit too much like the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, which is poisonous um, and can lead to severe GI distress if consumed. There are many different toxins produced by these uh, poisonous mushrooms, each one causing different clinical manifestations and a level of severity. Mushroom poisoning is one of those diagnoses that is extremely difficult to diagnose without the help from your patient. Uh, in this case, that help comes in the way of a provided history of eating mushrooms. Acute liver failure and renal failure are the most commonly cited life-threatening manifestations. The next group of mycotoxins are aflatoxins. These are produced by Aspergillus species. There are at least 14 different types and they can contaminate corn, soybeans, and peanuts. When consumed in large amounts, they can cause liver failure, which is very rare. However, while chronic exposure is typically asymptomatic, it is also both more common and significantly increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. To minimize the risk of aflatoxin ingestion, extra care must be taken when grain is harvested, dried, and stored. This includes trying to prevent damage to grains during harvesting, which increases the ability of aspergillus spores to infect it. Stored grains should also be routinely inspected for the development of mold growth. The last type of mycotoxin poisoning, that from ergot alkaloids, is the most interesting of the three. Inadvertent poisoning occurs from consumption of grains contaminated with fungi of the genus Claviceps, particularly Claviceps purpurea. We can see evidence of such an infection here, with that dark brown structure hanging down from the grain in the middle. This is called a sclerodium, and it contains a very high concentration of these compounds. Claviceps most commonly infects rye, wheat, and barley. And this category of chemicals, called ergot alkaloids, is fairly diverse, and different amounts of different alkaloids can be produced depending upon the species and the conditions. But all of them incorporate this four-ringed compound called ergoline into their structure, which results in them having similar actions in the human body as some neurotransmitters, and it also gives some of these drugs, or sorry, some of these compounds, uh, vasoconstricting properties as well. Uh, this is a quick tangent, but the study of ergoline and other naturally occurring ergot alkaloids has resulted in the discovery of several important drugs. These include ergotamine, which is a migraine medication, bromocryptine, used in Parkinson's disease, as well as to suppress production of the hormone prolactin in a number of situations. And finally, naturally occurring ergot alkaloids were the original starting point for the organic synthesis of lysergic acid diethylamide, otherwise known as LSD. While LSD is now considered a potentially dangerous hallucinogen, when it was first discovered, there was hope it could have potential use in the treatment of a variety of psychiatric disorders, which of course turned out to not be the case. Please be aware that all of these drugs are synthesized from naturally occurring ergot alkaloids, but they themselves are not found in nature. In other words, chomping down on some Clavicips purpurea isn't going to get you high or cure your headaches, 
Um, instead, it will probably kill you. And what exactly do the naturally occurring ergot alkaloids actually do in the human body? Well, it causes a disease called ergotism, uh, which actually has two fairly distinct forms. In the acute form, in which the neurotransmitter effect of these compounds predominate, the primary symptoms are seizures, hallucinations, mania, vomiting, and diarrhea. In the chronic form, in which the vasoconstricting effects seem to predominate, the primary symptoms are related to ischemia and the development of dry gangrene of the extremities. Ergotism is rare in the 21st century, but it has been seen intermittently in dramatic outbreaks throughout history. One of the more interesting theories in the field of medical anthropology is that ergotism was actually responsible for the bewitchment witnessed in colonial Salem, uh, eventually leading to the infamous Salem Witch Trials. In Salem, Massachusetts, over the course of 15 months, uh, from 1692 to 1693, a group of residents accused their neighbors of casting spells and invoking black magic to cause a variety of physical ailments, including seizures, hallucinations, and GI disturbances. The accused were put on trial, which relied almost solely on supernatural evidence, and ultimately 20 people were executed for crimes related to being witches. Now, a variety of theories have been put forth as to what triggered the witch trials, which have come to represent the epitome of mass hysteria, and one such theory is that the accusers had legitimate physical afflictions, that were, which were actually caused by unrecognized ergot alkaloid poisoning uh, occurring in the community. I'm going to move away from mycotoxins now and discuss a little bit about mold exposure and allergies. Mold exposure can trigger uh, several allergic disorders, including asthma, a condition called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, or ABPA, which I'll talk more about in a few minutes, allergic fungal rhinitis, which is sort of the upper airway version of ABPA, and probably the most severe of the group, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a form of interstitial lung disease that has the potential to lead to respiratory failure. Because of these known associations, a small industry has cropped up in which people try to relate mold exposure in specific homes to the development of these disorders among people living in them. For any patients diagnosed with ABPA, allergic fungal rhinitis, or hypersensitivity pneumonitis without an alternative explanation, doctors may recommend to the patient that he or she hired a mold expert to come in and inspect their home for possible unappreciated exposure. Unfortunately, identifying an indoor mold to allergy relationship in a specific individual is challenging for a number of reasons. These include the fact that there are no established safe limits for indoor mold. In other words, everyone has some degree of mold in their home. No matter how clean it looks to your eye, there's some mold there, and there's mold spores floating around in the air. Unfortunately, we just don't know where to, where to draw the line as to what amount is safe. In addition, visible mold growth in a home is not a reliable measure of exposure. Just because we can see mold does not mean there are spores in the air. And conversely, as I just mentioned, a lack of visible mold does not mean there are not spores there. Also, there is no reason to think that all mold species carry the same risk of adverse health effects. So what are people supposed to do? Because this is a real problem and with real adverse health effects. But experts are kind of hard to find and there's not really any specific qualifications that um, are standardized from state to state in terms of who's able to come in and actually make a relationship between your, your home and your, your disease. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not remotely knowledgeable about indoor mold problems. So instead, I'll refer anyone who's interested um, in this problem to this excellent review paper as to how you can interpret what a mold inspector has to say about your home. One specific disorder that I would like to talk more about briefly is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is sort of like the prototypical disease in which mold exposure can trigger an allergy. Uh, ABPA is a hypersensitivity reaction that's seen in patients with either asthma or cystic fibrosis whose bronchial tree becomes colonized with aspergillus. The clinical presentation includes recurrent episodes of fever, malaise, uh, production of brown mucus plugs, peripheral eosinophilia, and uh, occasionally hemoptysis. 
some patients will go on to develop an eosinophilic pneumonia. ABPA has no strict diagnostic criteria that experts can agree on, but rather a diagnosis is currently based on some combination of a history of asthma or cystic fibrosis, peripheral eosinophilia, an elevated total IgE and or elevated anti-aspergillus IgE uh, antibody titer, skin test reactivity to aspergillus antigens, and lung infiltrates on chest x-ray. It's important to realize the clinical features are not directly due to aspergillus infection, but rather to the allergic response to aspergillus colonization. Therefore, treatment typically consists of a combination of steroids to reduce inflammation and antifungals to reduce the burden of aspergillus, though its presence can typically not be completely eradicated. Both drugs are continued for months. I'm going to end this video by talking about those conditions which are not caused by fungi. You might wonder why I'm taking the effort to do this, but unfortunately it is apparently necessary. Viewers from the United States may remember this story from the past several weeks. Uh, Michelle Fiore, who is a Nevada Assemblywoman, made some strange comments on her weekly radio program that suggest that she believes cancer isn't just caused by a fungus, but apparently is a fungus itself. She said, and I quote, If you have cancer, which I believe is a fungus, and we can put a pick line into your body and we're flushing with, say, salt water, sodium carbonate, through that line and flushing out the fungus. These are some procedures that are not FDA approved in America that are very inexpensive, cost effective, end quote. Now there's so much crazy packed into that quotation, I'm not sure it will be an effective use of time to unpack it completely. However, I want to point out this one thing. First and foremost, with the same certainty that we know the moon is not made of green cheese, we can say that cancer is not a fungal infection, period. And with the exception of the increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in people with chronic aflatoxin ingestion, there is no other established link between fungus exposure and malignancy. You may ask why should we care what some random state politician thinks? Well, it's because she was discussing this belief of hers in the context of supporting legislation that would actually impact people's health care in a way that is dependent on these kooky ideas. And the scariest part about this? Apparently Ms. Fiore owns and operates a home health care company. So even among supposed health care professionals, there apparently is a lot of confusion over fungi and the human body. So let's run through some conditions for which there is no credible scientific evidence linking them to fungi, despite what people on the internet frequently claim to the contrary. Cancer, aside from the aforementioned aflatoxin ingestion, spontaneous abortions, autoimmune disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and uh, psychiatric disease, particularly depression. To be clear, I'm not stating that there is absolutely no chance ever that medical science will link fungi to these problems. After all, links between infections and cancer risk have been uncovered uh, in recent years, for example, between the H. pylori bacteria and gastric cancer, and the hepatitis B and C viruses and hepatocellular carcinoma. What I am stating is that anyone who is currently claiming a link between any of these problems and a fungal infection is completely guessing based on no data and in the absence of a plausible mechanism. Finally, let's discuss something called candidal overgrowth syndrome, also known as candidiasis hypersensitivity and a host of other similar sounding synonyms. In this condition, commensal canada, which normally lives in the gut and are part of the normal flora, supposedly proliferate beyond what is normal and healthy, leading to all kinds of problems, including chronic fatigue, diarrhea, inflammatory bowel disease, ADD, depression, anxiety, specific dietary cravings, lupus, and if you can believe it, multiple sclerosis. There are websites out there which talk about candle overgrowth and a whole internet community has sprung up around healthcare professionals who claim to be able to diagnose and treat this elusive condition. Unfortunately, and I honestly don't mean to alienate any viewers who discovered this video by researching their own candidal overgrowth diagnosis, 
but this disease does not exist. There is no credible scientific evidence of its existence. It is quackery, pure and simple. What's the harm being caused by giving people this diagnosis? Well, first, antifungal medications are expensive and far from benign. People have literally died from the side effects of antifungal drugs. And second, by latching on to a bogus diagnosis, there's a lost opportunity to make the correct diagnosis and actually help the patient get better. The bottom line is that for a lot of patients out there, fungi seem to be the boogeyman. And I don't know if it's just because mushrooms grow on dead things and are kind of gross, or because mildew and mold make your home seem dirty, but apparently it can be really easy to believe that almost any ailment at all can somehow be blamed on a fungal infection. As I discussed in these last two videos, fungal disease is quite real, quite common, and in rare cases can be quite devastating, but that doesn't mean that fungi are responsible for all human misery. So if you encounter a healthcare professional who begins talking about cannabis overgrowth syndrome or similar sounding nonsense, I strongly encourage you to seek a second opinion. That concludes this video on toxins, allergies, and quackery as they relate to fungi. I'm sorry about the brief rant at the end, but pseudoscience seems to sneak into this topic more than most. The next and final video in this series on fungal disease will cover antifungal medications.